Today I have the pleasure of introducing Koi Christmas, uh, CEO and co-founder of Facetto. So Facetto is a company that's building a next generation storage and networking device called Link. Koi started Facetto about four years ago after a number of other successful technology startups. He is a serial entrepreneur with a super amount of energy, a passion for innovation, and uh, he's got some really visionary ideas about how technology can influence our lives. He's here today to share some of his insights with us, so please help me welcome Koi Christmas. I took this opportunity to talk to you guys more about Forever Moments. Um, like he was saying, we do make a pretty innovative product called Link. I am kind of wearing that all over my shirt. The, um, I always get the question, what does it do? How does it work? And I never get the question, you know, why? Why did you build that product? And why are you guys doing this? So I wanted to take this time to actually share that because we work closely with Samsung and I figured it'd be kind of more exciting to talk about that than you know, what the product can do that you can read up online about. So with that, we'll get started. In 1925, uh, September 26, today actually, 92 years ago, my grandmother, Emma Christmas, was born in Cottondale, Florida. She was uh, a fun little lady. She's a small four foot 11 woman still today at 92 years old, which is successful in life. She is one of 12 kids. Um, as you can see here there, they're getting a little older in age. But my grandmother has always been extremely important to me. My grandmother, though, sitting at four foot 11, has been someone I've always looked up to. Since I was about 12 years old, I've always looked down on top of her head. So to give you kind of an idea of her fiery little spirit, she'd always bring a chair over to me when I got in trouble, which basically hardly ever happened. And she'd get on the chair and she'd yell at me to make sure she was taller than I was. Now my grandmother, um, like some other grandmothers out there, likes to enjoy a glass of wine. Being the only grandson, I was uh, kind of the wine waiter, if you will, and I had to continuously get that for her. Now she'd say, Coy, could you bring me a glass of wine about right here? And she always indicates half full. If she'd indicated full, I would only have to get up half the amount of times, but I think she'd like to see me get up and go get more wine. But what got exciting was is that when I used to hang around my grandmother and she was drinking the wine, which I got to do that quite a bit, she started talking about stories, stories, memories and stuff that she did when she was a kid. Now, my grandmother grew up on a farm, and unlike a lot of other kids in the 1920s and 30s that would play hopscotch and roll sticks and wheels, my grandmother's stories were far more interesting than that. And most of those stories I can't really tell you guys here, otherwise it said it was comedy hour or a rated R movie. So, I can't go into some of those, but I can tell you some of the other ones that she did do. Now, for fun, my grandmother family would take uh, kerosene, or they'd take socks, excuse me, and they would dip them into kerosene, old socks, and they'd have to sit there for a couple of days. And then they would lather their hands up in grease, all 12 kids, and they'd light that sock on fire, and they'd play hot potato. <laughs> that is a whole different version of hot potato than what probably most of us are used to, but that was fun for her. Another fun story she would tell me about was they would go out to the tall trees and they'd climb the trees and get to the top of the tree and then somebody would chop the tree down and you ride the tree to the ground and you jump out at the last moment. <clears throat> now I've been bumped and bruised quite a bit as a kid. I'm 41 years old now and so I grew up around skateboards, playing football, getting rough sports and I'd hear my grandmother ride my tail all the time about, hey, put a helmet on, put some pads on yet she was jumping out of, uh, you know, falling trees. I should back up to say that she didn't always jump out of the falling trees. As a matter of fact, she goes, I'm not like those idiot kids. I didn't do that. I watched them do that. So clearly people were doing it. She just didn't want to be a part of it. Now, my grandmother married my grandfather. Uh, he actually grew up on the other side of the road, uh, Peanut Road, and they ended up having three kids. They did a tremendous amount of traveling. My grandfather was in the Army for nine years, 32 years in the Air Force, and worked for uh, Northrop for 17. He was a workaholic. Um, they traveled literally everywhere, created a lot of memories, and had a very good time. Now, with age, like anything else, you slowly start to, well, you don't, you're not 25 anymore. Your body starts to wear out on you. For some people at the age of 92, their knees start to go out or shoulders start to go out. For others, they start to lose their eyesight. My grandmother, like 47, other, 47 million other Americans out there, started to get Alzheimer's and dementia. And so the stories that my grandmother would tell that were so crisp and so clean and put you right back in that moment started to fade. Yes, she still has the half glass of wine. And yes, we'd still talk about the stories. But now the people would get confused. 
or the story wasn't as exciting as it used to be. Maybe you've experienced that before. So it was about five years, five, six years ago that I started knowing this is starting to take place. And I said to my grandma and grandfather, I'll be back. And I went out and bought uh, digital recorders. And I sat down with my grandparents and explained to them what the digital recorder does. I said, here's a digital recorder. Here's a red button on it. Made it simple as can be. Press the red button whenever you have time and you want to tell a story. Tell me the story of whatever you've got going on. If you want to provide some advice, you want to yell at me because I didn't call you in the morning at 7 o'clock, whatever it is, just record it onto that mic. And they'd ask, why would you want to do that? And I said, well, myself and my team, the things that we can do now is that we can take you and I can recreate you in a computer. I can make it so that I can take what your stories you're telling me and I can combine that with other things and make it so that your great, great, great grandkids could visit your program and be able to press play or ask it a question and it would be your voice that gives the answer back to them. Now, obviously, this is pretty much what her face would look like. She's like, what? Are you serious? And uh, I think everybody here is probably in technology one way or another. And you probably have the opportunity of telling your grandparents some really cool stuff. And when you do, they do give you that look like, you can do that? And it's like, yeah, we can do that. Uh, and it's a lot of fun. What I did notice that when I was with my grandparents, they would grab, and probably you have that at your houses or at your grandparents' houses, the photo chest. And she'd crack that out, obviously, with a glass of wine or have me actually go get it. We'd open it up, and we'd start going through all the different types of photos. And with those photos, and that's why probably they say the photo's worth a thousand words, that same story that she was not able to explain to me before, now she can remember every vivid moment of it. And you're right back in that moment with her. Now, her photo chest looks something like this. She's got all kinds of different versions. She's got VHS tapes, 35 millimeter film, Polaroids, different size of photos. You've probably seen this type of photo chest maybe at your parents' house or at your grandparents' house. If you go to the photo chest of my generation, at least, it looks, there's some analog aspects of it, but I got a lot of memories on zip drives, USB, SD cards, hard drives. Again, memories stored all over the place. You go to my son's generation, who he's 17 years old, and his stuff is stored on a tablet, a computer, or his phone, or Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook. I love it when he comes to me, he's like, Dad, oh, last weekend I saw the coolest car. I'm like, really? Let me see a picture of it. I can't show it to you. Why? It was on my story. It's gone now. And that was his snap. I'm like, well, what is that going to do for you in 30 years from now? How are you going to be able to recall that memory if you can't get access to it? If you guys are all familiar with the movie Inside Out, I like to use this as an idea because it does help me define the next point. If you think about what a memory is, if you look at what Wikipedia describes it as, and it's the faculty by which the mind uh, transfers information, is encoded, stored, and retrieved. Memories are extremely important to our behavior. They're extremely important to our learning. They're extremely important to our motivation. If you are not able to recall your past events, how are you going to be able to handle a future event? If you didn't have your memories, it'd be hard for you to be able to learn a language. It'd be hard for you to be able to build relationships it'd be hard for you to establish a personal identity. So memories, to me and to my team, are extremely important. Memories are your photos. Memories are your videos. Because there's emotions that are tied to those. When you watch a movie or you watch a video or you look at a picture, you're able to reflect back at that moment and something is spurred inside your body. Over time, we've had, well, the ability to store information digitally on multiple different mediums. Some of those mediums today are no longer present. Other mediums are still present, but I like to challenge people and say, hey, could you plug your zip drive in right now to your tablet? No, you can't do that. Could you plug your USB stick inside your phone? Maybe some phones with an adapter. What I'm getting at is that you have your memories fragmented over all these different areas, and it's very difficult for you to be able to access those as technology starts to change and starts to grow. Again, moving over to Pixar, if you think about how we are today, the human, where do we store our information? Our information is not stored in our knees and in our ankles. We store everything in our brain, a singular location. So why do we store our memories fragmented across everywhere else? Now, some people would say to me, well, Coy, the cloud is the answer for that. And I would say, maybe it is. Now, we're not anti-cloud. What we're saying is that 
The issue with the cloud is when you cannot connect to the cloud. Whether it's a connectivity issue, a slow connection, or you can connect to it just fine, but what's the cost of you connecting to it? Public Wi-Fi, airplane Wi-Fi, or excuse me, airport Wi-Fi, or your data roaming, because you're traveling to another country. So then it's like, well, does the cloud work for you? And like I was saying, unfortunately, sometimes you can't connect, and that happens all too often. Maybe not right here where you're sitting right now, but when you're traveling abroad, or you live where I live, where we have hamsters that run the internet. So it's not as strong as we'd like it to be. Today's world, we are starting to have so many different devices that are able to capture our memories. You've got anywhere from GoPros to cameras, and so your action cameras to regular cameras, to the cameras that you have on your phone and your tablet. Those are the ones you use the most with. Furthermore, though, as you start stepping out of those content creating devices, you start getting into smart devices. And smart devices today are really starting to ga gather more senses. Some of the smart devices are obviously able to take down your heart rate. I mean, how cool would it be that you were able to watch a movie? So I'll call it a scary movie. I think it just came out not too long ago, and there's a part that freaks you out. And then all of a sudden, you want to rewatch it again two months from now, and that heart rate monitor you had on you was able to replay your heart rate at the same rate that you had it when you got freaked out of that movie. So now you can watch that movie again and actually have the same elevated response that you had beforehand. With smart devices and being able to tie these things together, it's entirely possible. Now, smart devices are starting to grow quite a bit. There's a, a, a neurologist that's working out there by Theodore Berger, who has been working almost three decades now on a memory implant. He's trying to make it so you're able to access your long-term memories. That is a pretty impressive thing to be able to accomplish. The way he wants to do it is he wants to put an SD card right here behind your eye. And I'm just teasing, just joking. Just wanted to throw it up there, <laughs> get, away, get you guys to go, what, you're eating, just teasing. However, there is the cochlear implants, which maybe you might have heard of before, but hundreds of thousands of people today, deaf people, are able to hear now because they're able to take their um, uh, converting electrical signals down to the auditory nerve. It's not far-fetched that when you look at the implant uh, devices that we have today, electro, uh, electro implants, excuse me, that now people that are paralyzed are able to move certain bodies, parts with just their thought. That is pretty impressive. That is where smart devices are starting to go. And then you would say, well, maybe that's not just as much a smart device. And I would challenge that if you start thinking about how you can bring all these things together, especially when you start tying in your memories into them. And after all, who wouldn't want to have a robotic arm to be able to do a fist bump? That'd be pretty cool. Now, I'm not trying to imply that we're trying to move to a Johnny Mnemonic type scene where you're able to just download everything right into your brain and move it to somewhere else, because that gets a little creepy. So we don't want to go there right now. But what I am trying to imply is that you have yourself a 24-7 content utopia or your memories available everywhere. There's no more restrictions. And what I mean by restrictions, you don't have a connectivity restriction. You don't have a device restriction. You don't have an operating restriction. You're able to move your content that you create, your memories that you create, onto any device that you want to at any time. Which means that in the future, you would be able to make your phone calls and talk to people right in the mirror inside your bathroom. You would be able to pick up and take a look at the weather on a, on a window, whether we, no matter where you're at. Or you're able to watch a movie or talk to your kids and see what they, happened throughout their course of the day at the countertop in the kitchen. Now again, that's not too far-fetched to do because these are actually things that are available today. However, they all run into the same principles and problems of operating systems and trying to move that content from one place to another because that doesn't work seamlessly between each single platform. If you were to think about the fact that you could record all of your senses, and maybe not for my grandma right now because she's getting a little older, but for my great and great grandkids, for the stuff that we're building today, and we're able to start gathering all of your senses and record them in a single location, and there becomes a device out there that you're able to replay all of those senses, then technically you would be able to go back to a certain day in your previous, or earlier in your life, pick a day, and play that exact moment in your life and recreate every one of those senses. And if you think about that, to be able to do that, to go back in that time frame, it would be time travel.